One thing that I always adore is getting supplementary material for media that I'm a fan of. Little side stories, expanded origin stories, and even little follow-ups or epilogues to the main plot. Just little bits of material that help slightly expand what's already there. And this can be something I can enjoy in many different forms too, be it manga, audio dramas, games, or anime, depending on what the source material is. In general, I feel like adapting one form of media into another is usually a little bit of a waste of time, with the only exception being when it actually adds something to it. Manga to anime, for example, works pretty well most of the time, since while a few things are obviously lost in the process, because they always are, the additions of voice acting, music, and motion all add more to it than it takes away, usually at least. But outside of that, I think usually the adaptation process is kind of not really worth it in a lot of cases. Which is why when I discover mangas like Persona 5 Memento's Mission and Trails from Zero The Ring of Judgment, or stuff like that one Sailor Moon RPG for the SNES that takes place between seasons 3 and 4, I get really excited for obtaining the concept of the quote-unquote complete story, despite knowing that everything in it is just extra and probably fairly inconsequential. These days, the mystique of all this sort of stuff is kind of weird thin, since it's even more evidently just about the money rather than the art, which, while admittedly is probably what it was still about before, it didn't feel as obvious. These days, if a Western media outlet is attempting to do it, 99% of the time they're trying to establish their own Marvel Cinematic Universe so they can trick people into buying everything they produce due to FOMO. And if it's a Japanese media outlet, they're usually trying to implement the Psy Games method of We'll flood the market with horse girls, and if we keep pushing our game, manga, anime, albums, merchandise for a year straight, eventually people are going to start liking it. R right And it turns out they were right. This is why these days, for supplementary material to truly get me excited, it usually has to be something that completely flew under my radar, or something that only recently was made available to me. And that's exactly what I found with Persona 4 The Magician, or what I think is more commonly referred to as simply the Yosuke manga. A one-shot prequel manga to Persona 4 set before the events of the game detailing everything between Yosuke moving to Inaba and him getting his persona all from his perspective. I was pretty busy when I first caught wind of it, so I didn't let myself read it immediately despite its low commitment time, but I did have a bookmark linked ready for the moment I could, and I'm definitely glad that I did. While the Yosuke manga isn't going to blow you away anytime soon, it does have some neat things in it, and I did like how it re-established Yosuke as a character for me, as well as give me a way to relive the first bit of Persona 4 in a way that's very fresh, since as much as I'd like to go back and play Persona 4 one day, replaying long RPGs isn't really something I have time for. So with that all said, what's actually new about the Yosuke manga, and what does it add that we've never seen before? What secrets lie beyond these pages? Well, we get to see Yosuke as a city kid for starters, and we also get introduced to who his boyfriend was before he found his lifelong partner in Yu, and we get a small glance at Yosuke's first six months in Inaba before P4 starts, with him establishing his friendships with Chie, Yukiko, and everyone else over the school festival, as well as developing his crush for Saki. The actual new content here is admittedly not that much, making up slightly less than half the volume, with the rest of it being just the beginning of the game from his perspective instead. There's no shocking revelation like Yosuke was nearly the Velvet Room guest before you, or anything quite like that, but honestly something like that would be very hard to actually pull off and would probably come across as cheap and tacky more than anything. Instead we get a much more intimate look and constant spotlight on someone who usually has to share it with everyone else. And while there isn't anything new, there are topics from the main game that were either given slightly more context or kind of fill in the blanks to things that were originally left up to your imagination a bit. Now, before I continue, I know Yosuke is a bit of a divisive character these days due to how he acts at certain times, both towards the girls of the group and how he deals with Kanji. And I'm someone who really chalks all of that stuff up to just the time period the game was released in, as well as Japan's views on stuff like sexuality being weirdly progressive in some ways, but 
incredibly archaic in others, but I've never felt it right blaming the character on such things, since considering Yosuke was meant to have a gay romance route that was taken out slash dropped by what was essentially focus testing, which resulted in him coming across very differently at points. The way I've always seen his character is with the context of the cut content that should still be there, but also with plot details from some of the older Persona games shifting my perspective a bit. In P1 and P2, the concept of the wild card doesn't really exist, but instead everyone is able to use multiple Personas, but are restricted to Akanas that they are compatible with. The whole theme of the games is that, like in real life, we have different hardships that we have to deal with, and we have different masks, different Personas, which we use to overcome them. This means that it's still possible to have shadows, parts of you that you refuse to accept even if you do already have a persona. The only reason the cast of the modern Persona games aren't able to summon multiple different kinds of personas is a mixture of gameplay reasons as well as them kind of only being able to do so much with how they get their abilities. With these two things in mind, I've always kind of seen his incessant homophobia and sexism to be more of a coping mechanism more than anything else. Part of his character is he both enjoys the acknowledgement of his peers, but also wishes to never really stand out among them. And one way he does this is by acting in a way that he and 2008 Japan would probably deem as quote unquote normal. And while all of that stuff is cut and you could very easily say, oh it's just not part of the game anymore, that's not what Yosuke's character is, I don't believe in the slightest that a 100% straight guy would go around calling his friend his partner and spending time thinking about him in bed. Regardless, all of this stuff of him trying to blend in amongst his friends is stuff that we see in various ways across the main game, with Yosuke very happily playing second banana to you, and it's stuff like this that the Yosuke manga kind of has crop up throughout the entire way through, mostly shown via a collection of random stray thoughts that Yosuke has creep up throughout the manga. His shadow is less about him being bored being in the country, and more that in the city he's able to keep himself entertained without ever having to actually let himself get close to others. This is where Katsuragi comes into play. Katsuragi is essentially the closest thing Yosuke had to a best friend before the move, which is sad since he comments on the fact that the two of them have never actually talked to each other much one on one. After the move, the two of them do still stay in contact with each other, but it's only really because of Katsuragi making an effort, and even then, Yosuke really struggles to maintain much contact with him, as he assumes that no one would care about the country things that he's doing, and would think it's weird that he's enjoying such things. I really do think that this is what the core of Yosuke's shadow is, but unfortunately due to memes over the last few years, the general take on his arc has devolved into Wow, living in the country is pretty boring, when that is actually just a very minor part of what the shadow represents. It's why he's so sick of being seen as the enemy to so many of the town's locals. He despises the direct attention of all of it more than anything else, and it's why he felt such a connection to Saki. At first it was simply because she reached out to him after being there for when he first experienced the gossiping locals. But after realising that she was also a victim of the flapping gums of Inaba's grannies, I think that's when Yosuke was finally beginning to push himself out of his previous mindset. In fact, if anything, this is in some ways a Saki Kanishi manga as much as it is a Yosuke manga. Considering the fact that she has one interaction with Yosuke while Yu's around, just about every single scene that she's in in the manga is something original, and it really helps her be more than just Yosuke's dead crush. Granted, all of her screen time effectively consists of stuff that the player would have likely assumed anyway based on what we do see of her, but it's just a generally nice thing to see, and also just helps give that slightly more definitive answer to what Saki's true feelings for Yosuke were, and whether or not the voice we heard in the TV world was actually her or her shadow. It was probably her shadow. Now, you could just say that all of this is invalidated, as it's probably not all that important, and also just not canon. And you'd be right, but this is why headcanons exist, and when they're backed up by some sort of official source, then, you know, that's it, it, it's pretty cool. 
Also, this might just be me looking into things too much and thinking that the manga's deeper than it actually is, but something I also really appreciated is that I got the feeling that Saki's interaction with Yosuke was doing a lot to help him overcome his shadow without using mystical TV world bullshit and instead just doing it the normal way. This is something Persona does with non-party member social links for obvious reasons, but I think it's very easy to forget that the cast didn't need to be thrown into the TV to overcome their problems. It was more of just a shortcut that also gave them anime powers in the process. And between interacting with Saki and meeting you, we actually get to see Yosuke start moving in that direction all on his own, and it's actually the existence of the TV world which causes him to actually regress back into how he was before until he eventually manages to confront his shadow later. And actually, speaking of you, there's this pretty small throwaway but admittedly cute set of pages where you accidentally bumps into Yosuke's old friends just before getting on the train for Inaba. And there's this small passing of the torch moment between him and Katsuragi. It doesn't really add anything of substance, but it's this cool bit of symbolism regardless, and I, I did cheer out and clap a little bit. Though, yeah, that's just about everything that really stood out to me in the Yosuke manga. It's a cool short read and a very small time commitment, so if you're interested, do just give it a flick through yourself, it's not long at all. One final thing that I think really made me appreciate the manga though, is that it made me realise, or rather confirmed my assumption that, boy would I love a Persona or Atlas game in general, just with a normal protagonist that isn't silent all the time. Even having a story that I already knew, but just told from the perspective of an actual character was so refreshing to me, and something I wish Atlas would at least give a shot at. Whether that be its own game with a real main character, or little side things like this. Give me origin or side stories of the different party members, be it like Persona 5 The Chariot, or Persona 3 The Empress, just something like that would be super interesting to me. Just being able to see the world from the perspective of anything other than a self-insert character would be such a godsend to people like me, who can relate to characters but really can't project onto them, but alas, I don't think I'll ever get that wish. Thanks for watching everyone, uh, I know this one was a bit of a short one, especially since it's been a fairly hot minute since the Rido video, but uh, rest assured I am working on a video for Shin Megami Tensei 5, I'm just, you know, slowly chipping away through it. Figured I'd make this just to tide everyone over for a little bit. There might be one more small video after the SMT5 one. I'm not entirely sure what, like, what I'm going to do first. Between work and just feeling a little bit burnt out, I've kind of been jumping between different projects and kind of juggling them all at the same time, so we'll see what happens with that. I also want to try doing a couple of slightly different video formats. Stuff that's kind of more not video based, just so I can kind of up my output a little bit more. I've played through the majority of the modern Ninja Gaiden games recently, and I kind of want to do something on it, but I really don't feel like I've got enough to say to make a big, proper, structured, edited video just on each game, or even the entire series really, but I do kind of want to do some sort of, just sort of long ramble video where I get my thoughts out for the series in general. But yeah, and until next time, see ya!